Hello and welcome to Season 3, Episode 13, lucky number 13, of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host this evening, Andrew DeBlock, coming to you live from our headquarters here in Johannesburg at Pistol House. Tonight's show is about the much vaunted Albatross Task Force and their industry-leading work protecting seabirds from threats at sea. But before we get to that, just a reminder to communicate with us using the chat box as well as the Q&A box in Zoom, or if you're watching us on Facebook Live tonight, you can use the comment feed. Please use the hashtag, hashtag conservation conversations on all major social media channels to let us know what you think of the show. And you can catch up with all of our previous episodes via BirdLife South Africa's YouTube channel. And there are now over 90 episodes, nearly 100. Just a couple of weeks, we hit our 100th episode for you to enjoy. Thank you, as always, for the generous contributions towards our webinars, which help to keep these shows free for everyone to learn and enjoy. You can visit the Quicket page or EFT BirdLife South Africa directly and use the reference webinars and your name to do so. And we're excited once again to bring back the donations competition to our show. A big thank you to both Peter and Irene Jin for this generous support. The ultimate companion for birding Southern Africa is a fantastic book. I have one personally, and I can highly recommend giving you a chance, yourself a chance to win this exciting prize. All you need to do is donate at least 100 Rand via Quicket before the end of May, and one lucky viewer will walk away with this exciting prize. The uh, competition is only open to our South African viewers, unfortunately, and uh, consider it just buying each of the three hosts for Conservation Conversations a copy these days in South Africa that will get you over 100 bucks. BirdLife South Africa's Fast and Featherless Cycling Team are back and will be part of this year's Ride Joburg event on the 22nd of November. You can ride for a purpose and help us in our mission to protect South Africa's most threatened ecosystems and the birds that rely on them. When registering for your spot, simply use the codes on screen depending on the distance you'd like to ride. That's either BIRD867 for the 97 kilometer ride or BIRD431 for the 35 kilometer shorter ride. To find out more, please email Abigail, Abigail Ramuzuli by the email on the top right of the screen. And I will be posting her email um, as well as this link in the chat box as well once Andreas kicked off. BirdLife South Africa is proud to be driving the official declaration of the Middle Pint Nature Reserve in Pumalanga. This initiative will formally secure the only known breeding site of the critically endangered white meat plata in South Africa and adds additional protection to the Greater Larkin Plate Protected Environment Landscape. Dr. Carl Lloyd from BirdLife South Africa has set up an easy letter of support um, that you can all sign to support this important initiative. People often ask us how they can assist with our conservation efforts, and this might be the most easy way yet and a very straightforward opportunity. You can click the link, which again, I will post in the chat box in a moment. Um, just put in your details and thereby submit your letter of support with just a click of a couple of buttons. Please take note that BirdLife South Africa's annual general meeting will take place virtually on the 28th of May, 2022 at 10 a.m. And the link to register to attend again will be posted in the chat box. I can encourage you all to attend. There'll be some exciting announcements, some awards being given out. And uh, people were asking me on social media this week about when the next uh, flock at sea is going to happen. And um, I'm not going to give you too much information, but I can tell you that if you want to be the first to know, then you've got to attend the AGM. So do please register using the link that will be in the chat box just shortly. And now on to the main event. Um, Andrea Angel or Andrea Angel, depending if you want to pronounce it the English or the Spanish way. Andrea, I hope I got that right. Um, heads up the Albatross Task Force team whose primary objective is to mitigate at sea threats to seabirds through research development of initiative mitigation measures and approaches, as well as ensuring working on various advocacy initiatives. She and her team are responsible for keeping the thousands of pelagic seabirds that come to forage in our rich oceans safe from getting caught in fishing gear. And I know Reason Ningera, who is her second in command, is with us in the audience tonight. Andrea herself has worked on seabird conservation related projects since 2003. That's nearly two decades, and I'm sure Andy is finding that quite a scary fact. And that was after she completed her master's in conservation biology at the University of Cape Town. She spent considerable time on remote islands around the world, 
including Marion Island and a year on Gough Island, where she uh, developed her love for Tristan albatrosses. And there she was dealing with the management of invasive species that threaten seabird survival, conducting research and working on invasive mammal eradication projects. Of course, most people will be familiar with our Mastery Marion project, uh, which Andrea has also given inputs into from the seabird conservation program side. Originally from Chile, she has lived on three continents and has been based in Cape Town for the last 20 years. Andrea um, is a good friend of mine and an old uh, compatriot from the Seabird Conservation Program when I was still based in the Cape. It really is a pleasure to welcome you onto Conservation Conversations and um, I'm very much looking forward to your presentation tonight. Over to you. Thank you, Andrew, for that uh, introduction. And yeah, I'm really, really happy to be here too. Uh, this is the second talk I've given on the Arbitrus Task Force. So I'll just uh, start. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, you need to unshare, I think, Andrew. All right. Okay. And there we go. Okay. Um, and then I'll just switch off my video so that it doesn't interfere with recording afterwards. I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just kick off. So the Albertus Task Force um, has been around for quite a few years and um, we're at a stage where we are tackling um, challenges. Things are not uh, as easy as they were initially. And we also wanting to maintain the reductions that we successfully um, started off with. So I'll start off with, um, with a video. And let me just, there we go. No. Why is this not going? Um, um, it's not clicking, there we go. Um, once you see your first albatross, you're hooked. They're incredible animals. They're absolutely magical. They breed most of them every two years, lay a single egg and take more than a year to raise a single chick to fledging status. And their bond with their chick is absolutely incredible. That has definitely captured me and I have never looked back. Of all the birds in the world, seabirds are considered the most endangered group of birds. One of the main threats to them is seabird bycatch. South Africa has an incredibly rich coastline and our waters are nutrient rich, which brings a lot of the seabirds from New Zealand, from the Falkland Islands, from all over the world. The number of seabirds that come here are in the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of birds that forage here every year. They breed on different islands and they come to forage in our seas. So our responsibility is very high in terms of trying to reduce the impact on the global populations of seabirds. Seabirds are attracted to two things. They are attracted to the bait that is used by some of the vessels, but fisheries also discard a lot of the unwanted parts of fish. And that is a, an incredible lure for seabirds. And then when they come for the discards, they collide with the cables which are holding to the nets and then they get broken wings. And then in pelagic long lining, they set up lines of baited hooks and then as they come to steal the bait, they get caught on the hooks. In South Africa alone, an estimated 10,000 birds were dying in the trawl fishery every single year. And a simple measure was able to reduce that bycatch to less than 200 birds. My name is Mizen Mingera. I work in the Albatross Tax Force. My main role is to work together with the fishermen in trying to reduce the bird package. We have got simple ways like the use of bed scanning lines to scare the birds away from the danger zone so that they won't collide with the cables. We collaborate in making the bed scanning lines. We are working with persons with disabilities from Ocean View. They've got different projects which they are working on. We supply them with the material 
then they make bed screen lines for us, and then we sell them to the industry. Our main goal is to try to win the hearts of the fishermen and then try to explain why are we saving seabeds. And also to try to use the bottom-up methods of where they feel the responsibility of saving seabeds, of which that is happening. And I'm so excited with that. If we reduce the bycatch of seabeds one step at a time, overall, it's about saving our planet Earth. It's a very small team and we're trying to achieve a lot in South Africa and I'm very proud to say that we have achieved a lot and we are very ambitious. But it's not enough if we want to achieve this for species that roam the whole of the Southern Ocean and that visit different countries. So collaboration I think is absolutely key in us being able to achieve what we do. Thank you um, for watching that. Um, I wanted to start with that. It's a video that we've recently produced and it's to showcase our work and it's a good introduction, I hope, to, to my presentation. And also um, because we are probably not going to see many more seabirds um, and those are very nice images in that video. So just to restate the, the problem uh, that we're dealing with in South Africa, um, seabirds here are, are in contact or interact with about 300 commercial fishing vessels and they impact about 28 species of seabirds. And as I said in the, in the video, um, they are attracted to the bait, either through bait that is discarded from trawl fisheries or that is um, used to uh, bait the hooks that are used in long line fishery, which are the two main types of fishery that we have in South Africa and that overlap with our seabird populations. And when they, when they interact with the trawl fishery, they collide with the cables and the trawl of the trawl vessels and that's how they break their wings. And or they are lured to the bait in the long line fishery and, and swallow hooks. And thus they are exposed to around 7 thousand trawl sets and more than 40 million hooks that are set annually by all the commercial fishing vessels in South Africa. So what do we do about this? Um, one of the ways to, to mitigate this is using bird scaring lines and as we, so, as we showed in the video these are very simple. Uh, here is one when you're using it in a long line um, um, to mitigate seabird bycatch in a long line fleet. And it's a, simple, it's a simple line with streamers on, but they're very effective in protecting um, access and preventing the access of birds to these baited hooks until they have sunk for at least 10 meters uh, below the surface and are no longer accessible, at least to most of, this, most of the, the bigger seabirds. Some of the shearwaters can still access these baited hooks, but most of them, um, can't uh, the bigger birds. Other mitigation measures that we use and particularly in the long line fleet is setting um, our lines at night. If you set lines at night most of the birds like albatrosses and the bigger the bigger petrels aren't foraging then but it doesn't apply to all of them. Um, the white chin petrels do forage at night and they can then access these beta hooks regardless of, of when you're setting them. And when there is full moon, there is, uh, there is no uh, protection for, for the birds because they are, they, it's like full daylight and they are attracted to the beta hooks, all the, including albatrosses. So another measure that we use uh, also in the long line fishery is to weight down the hooks. So 
to try and get them to sink as fast as possible out of reach from uh, from the seabirds and and reach um so that so that they can't access the bait uh, that are on these hooks and there are different weighting systems that are used um in the demersa long line there's big concrete blocks and in the pelagic long line these some of these swivels are used to to weigh down the hooks so these are the three main mitigation measures that we use um, that are in use all over the world in one way or another, or that we are trying to get um, different vessels to use um, so that they can mitigate for seabird bycatch. Ideally, you would want to use all three at the same time in the long line fishery and trawlers should use 100% um, this, the bird scaring lines and also mitigate mm -hmm. in some way or prevent the discharge of the offal that really attracts the birds. And this is the task that we set ourselves at the Objects Task Force. So how have we done this so far? Uh, the, what we alluded to in the, in the video, well, the Objects Task Force started in 2006 um, and that's when it was launched in South Africa. And we work primarily with two fisheries, the Hector fishery and the foreign tuna longline fleet, which at the time was setting around 6 million hooks annually. And the trawl fishery has remained constant in terms of their, their fleet. Uh, so we have the same effort then as we, as we do now. And for about four years since its launch and during many sea days, um, data was gathered and it was, in, it was engaging fishermen to adopt bird scaring lines, to develop the bird scaring lines in South Africa and to start um, the fleet, convince the fleet to start using these, um, uh, the bird scaring lines as measure. And in the tuna longline fleet, um, the foreign one, we unfortunately couldn't engage with the fishermen in the same way that we did in the trawl fishery. So here it was more of working with the government to and um, installing more punitive measures and, and legislation, which could be considered more punitive, and sustained advocacy work for many years up to up to today with with the fishery and with government to ensure that uh, the bycatch in these in this foreign tuna longline fleet is reduced and it's through this work uh, that we achieved uh, what we mentioned in the video a 95 percent reduction in the seabird mortality in the trawl fishery in the offshore trawl fishery reducing the the annual deaths um, by uh, 9,000 9, birds that are saved annually through our work and also a fewer um, 2,500 birds are not dying in the foreign tuna longline fleet because of this work. And while these successes are significant, uh, they are, however, not enough. Uh, we are, uh, we need to sustain these reductions. It's not a matter of achieving these uh, measures and then walking away. We need to ensure widespread adoption of these, of these measures and also compliance with them so that hopefully in, at some point we can walk away and this is now part of common practice in not just the trawl and in the foreign longline fleet, but in all of the fisheries in South Africa that need these measures. And that remains a challenge. And that's part of most of my, my the rest of my talk will be talking about those. So the scope of the ATF is not just um, talking to fishermen and going out to sea, although that's quite a big component and an incredibly important one. We engage, we go to sea, we engage in port where we talk to fishermen in terms of uh, taking up mitigation measures, teaching them, making them aware of what, what dangers uh, are out there for the birds and how they can mitigate those. But we also do a lot of research. We research into mitigation measures. We are currently involved in electronic monitoring as a compliance tool. We also do training and workshop again to crew and to fisheries managers so that they can be made aware of the issue and participate in its solution. There's a lot of advocacy work. I think that's probably most of what I do is, is sit with government working groups, uh, work with fisheries associations directly and other industry stakeholders to ensure that these measures are taken up and that we create legislation so that uh, we can protect our seabirds. We work with a lot of organizations. We're not alone in the work that we do. Uh, we partner with them. And we also work internationally with other ATF team. Because as we mentioned, this problem is global. And if we don't address it from a global perspective, 
there, there is what we do in South Africa is maybe not a drop in the ocean, but it's not enough. So how do we work with our fleets? Um, there is a series of steps that we, that we have to do. And we start by characterizing the fleet and then we develop mitigation. And then we need to update the legislation so that it takes on those mitigation measures. We also involved in data and observer coverage because we need to make sure that those mitigations are upheld and they're actually used at sea. And then compliance. Compliance is one of the most important steps. If we don't have compliance, and we don't know that these measures are being used at sea, well, then we don't know, and we don't know whether they're being, they're being there's uptake and whether we're actually making a change or a difference at sea. And here's where we are with the different fleets that we're working with. We're working with seven different fleets, and each of these different fleets are in a different stage, and some of them overlap in the different stages um, in this chain of, of work. As you can see towards um, the, the right here, there's joint venture or the foreign Japanese vessel uh, fleet and the offshore tool, where we are at the final stage of this, where we are at the stage of sustaining these bycatch reductions. We no longer have to um, show how they work. We no longer have to um, create awareness at that level. We have to make sure, though, that we don't take our gas off foot of the gas and make sure that we keep engaging with these two fleets so that these measures are taken up and sustained and both can lines are bought every year and things like that. So um, where are we today and why are we facing challenges? So if we look at this list, this is uh, what we what the different fleets look like. Um, we have the different fleet names. There's a Demersal Long Line, which uh, catches Hake. There's also a Pelagic Tuna Long Line fleet, a domestic one, not just a foreign one. There is Tuna Pole, which also catch uh, tuna. There's a midwater trawl, there's an inshore trawl, and there's an offshore trawl. There are several fleets that we are working with. And if we look at where we are today, what we, those, the two green ones are where we are, where we feel we uh, are at a level of sustaining bycatch reductions. The rest of these fleets require significant work still, be it from implementation of bycatch mitigation measures, they are maybe not using the bird scan lines or they're not um, weighting their, their, their hooks, or we haven't reached them at some other level, either be it legislation or observer coverage. No one's out there at sea monitoring whether these things are happening or not. So at different levels, we are, we are faced with different with different challenges and work that remains to be done in each of these fleets. And if we look at the number of vessels, which is um, a measure of also of effort of how much it is, how much is out there, we can see that um, while we've worked, um, done significant work in the offshore trawl, and there's a number of vessels there, other fleets have much higher numbers of vessels and they catch a lot more, put more hooks out there. And so our involvement with them is key. One of the fleets that I mentioned earlier was the foreign joint, uh, the, uh, foreign tuna long line uh, fleet, uh, where we initially, when we produced these reductions, significant reductions by introducing night setting and, and um, birds carrying lines, they were, they were setting about 6 million hooks. Currently, they're only setting, um, or they are maybe not only, it's a good thing. We only have one vessel, we used to have six, and now we only have one vessel present in, in South African waters. So the effort, the number of hooks in our waters has decreased. And that is a good thing on the one hand, uh, because it means that our birds are less at risk. It might also mean that the fleet has just moved on somewhere else where they're not facing these punitive measures that we introduced here in South Africa. However, what has happened is that as one fleet has uh, reduced its effort in South Africa, here in the, in the blue line is the foreign fleet, reducing the number of hooks that it sets every year, on the opposite side, our domestic effort has increased, meaning that a fleet that we didn't um, 
considered to be as important when we started this work um, in 2006 has now become quite significant and important for us to engage with because their effort has increased. And this is, um, while the gains are there um, in terms of reducing bycatch, there's also a switch in, in what we now need to do and we need to engage quite important, significantly with this domestic uh, tuna longline fleet. So how do we do this? Um, we have taken up until now two different approaches. Some one that we called um, carrot approach um, by offering markets in base incentives. And we work very closely with the Marine Stewardship Council and with South Africa Sustainable Seafood Initiative, who, produce, who provide um, incentives uh, to the fleets directly in terms of increasing their sales to um, other countries or locally. And then the stick or legislation or punitive measures that come more from a government side of uh, the government side and from other international organizations or agreements where fishing quotas, quotas are dependent on how you manage your, your uh, fisheries or permit conditions also put um, mitigation measures and uh, observer coverage requirements onto these different fleets. And so, and what's happened today is that the offshore Hake and the inshore Hake fleets, as well as the, the longline Hake fleet, have all been drawn um, to take on MSC certification or are in some way involved in market incentives through SASE. And whereas the tuna longline fleet, the foreign tuna longline fleet and the domestic tuna longline fleet aren't driven by these um, market incentives. And here is where government then needs to um, implement legislation or in some way um, manage these fisheries. And we sit in the middle of this, balancing all of these interacting be it with the, the market incentive or institutions directly, with government on the other side, uh, internationally, and also individually with each one of these fleets to balance and to leverage the carrots and sticks, as we call them. Our success so far has been quite clear with the offshore trawl heck fleet and with the foreign tuna longline fleet, but not so clearly with the inshore uh, Hague fleet or the long line um, Hague fleet. And then also there's been um, difficulties in, in us working with the tuna long line fleet. So how are we addressing these challenges? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll go through three examples. Um, one of these examples is the work that we're doing with the Demersal Inshore Hague Fleet, um, which is a project, it's a multi-stakeholder project. It's funded by the Marine Stewardship Ocean Stewardship Fund, it's a mouthful, uh, but it has allowed us to partner with um, the, the Fisheries Associations and with Observer um, Agency to drive this project forward. And in order to overcome the what we couldn't uh, lure them with. So how we worked very closely with the offshore fleet, but in the inshore, the carrot was not enough because we've been working, trying to work with this fleet since 2015, and they don't need to implement um, mitigation in the inshore fleet. It's not in the legislation. This fleet has by default marine stewardship certification because it, it's part of the big um, Hague certification that affects all of the trawl. So they didn't need to do anything more to actually reap the benefits in, in a way. They're also made up of small independent companies. And if we look at these two pictures, the top one is of a big vessel that can has more, um, can fish further offshore, can get a bigger catch. If we look at the bottom picture, this is a typical inshore, inshore vessel. And they don't go far in, into the offshore. The fish that they bring is mostly for the local market. And so the benefits for them are minimal in terms of market incentives offered by the Marine Stewardship Council. And they therefore didn't see um, mitigation measures as necessary. They often consider them risky and, and to be used on their vessels and expensive. So how did we address this through this project? 
Um, well, we secured funds to develop and trial really bespoke, um, safe and inexpensive mitigation measures for this fleet specifically, rather than going the legislative option of just saying, well, it's legal, you have to abide by the rules and offshore, you have to do the same in the inshore, knowing that these vessels weren't really going to be able to take up these measures. We went out and, and worked with them to develop more bespoke measures. We also provided incentives to um, fund part of their observer program that they are required to do under the MSC certification. And we also ensure that whatever we did under this project met their uh, MSC certification requirements. All of these are incentives. They're not the direct market incentives that we've used before, but they are incentives to this fleet that need, needs help. Here's reason in, in the picture teaching um, and showing one of the crew members how to install a bird scaring line. And through this process, we arrived at customized solutions that we engineered together with the crew. So they become, um, they are empowered by this and they become the owners of their solutions. And currently we are undergoing trials. Here is the bird scaring lines being used in one of the initial vessels that pre really didn't use bird scaring lines and they're using them effectively and successfully and the crew are happy with them. Another example where we, where we parted partnered with, um, in this case, an observer agency is for development of innovative compliance measures. Compliance, because um, we need to ensure that birth scaring lines are being used, whether there's an observer out there or someone out on this vessel looking out for that or not, the crew, uh, it needs to be, we can rely on the crew to some extent, but we also need some independent confirmation that these birth scaring lines are being used. So we received funds from, uh, from ACAP and embarked on this uh, fund project uh, working with uh, this agency. We'd come up with a very innovative um, device to ensure that bird scan lines were used uh, in a, were always being deployed and to measure that. Compliance is really important. Um, it, um, there's a challenge with it. We need to ensure that there's compliance in the absence of onboard observers. That's a challenge that we face. But there are also disadvantages of electronic monitoring as this is, because although it increases observer coverage and reduces observer cost, there's also high resistance from the crew and they might sabotage whatever you put on that cameras or any other device. And there's also a highly technical management, uh, data management that's often required and high startup costs. So for this device in particular, the advantage is that it's, um, a very tiny device. You can see they're attached to the bird scaring lines. It's circled there in red. And this is a, a tension device um, and that acts as um, that acts as um, sensing the, the pull of the bird scaring line. So when the, the bird scaring line is deployed, as you see in this in this graph here, the tension goes from zero up to 15 and then hovers as the bird scaring line is out at sea. And then when the bird scaring line is retrieved, the tension then goes back to zero. And the output that is from this device is this, is this graph, which also gives an exact output of when the date of when the, the bird scaring line was put out and the time that this happened. And we can corroborate this within the, um, the logbook data that tells us when the vessel was fishing and putting its net out. And if those two are the same, we know then that the bird scan line was deployed when it needed to be deployed and was deployed effectively. The third solution that we are coming up to working with our pelagic long line fleet, in this case, the domestic one, is another form of incentive. It's the Hookpot project. Now the Hookpot is, has been called the silver bullet for reducing seabird bycatch in the pelagic long line. It, um, it is as it looks here in the picture, it's a pod. Um, the hook goes into it once the, the hook has been baited. The hook goes into this pod and it gets completely encased by this pod and, and not able to expose the barb and therefore making it completely safe uh, for seabirds. They are, um, it's, an, it's an emerging technology, it's quite new. Um, it's been around for, for some years, but not 
but it's difficult to implement. It hasn't really been taken up by fishermen because it's difficult to convince them to put something on their gear um, directly onto their hooks. Um, that's interfering with, with fishing gear and any fisherman will tell you that, that it's not an easy thing to achieve. So it's taken some convincing. So through this project, we've secured the cooperation of one long line, long line uh, vessel skipper owner, and we have obtained 2000 hook pods that we want to trial in South Africa to assess if the hook pod will work in South African waters. So just briefly how the hook pod works, it is attached, um, as you see in this image, onto, onto the branch line. And you can see how the bait is attached to the hook and the barb of the hook then goes into the pod. And the barb of the hook is completely encased in the pod and then it's released into the water. It is thrown a uh, set with the, with the rest of the other branch lines with hook pods. And when the hook pod then sinks into to a set depth, usually around 20 meters and therefore out of reach of seabirds, there's a trigger mechanism that opens up the hook hook that opens up the pod and then releases the hook uh, with the bait still attached and ready to fish basically. So we don't know whether this will be uh, working still in South Africa, whether we'll achieve what the trial, the success of this trial is going to be. It's still up for, uh, we don't know, we haven't started it yet, but we are hopeful that this will be um, a solution in South Africa as well as it hasn't been in, in a couple of other countries where the, the pod has been implemented. These are the three examples of how we are dealing with these uh, fleets, remaining main remaining fleets like the initial trawl um, and long line, long line, domestic long line to address um, the issues of seabed bycatch that are outstanding and are remaining. We're not uh, done yet. There are a few fleets that uh, we're not working with. We haven't been able to start work with uh, that are still out there and catching birds. But we hope that this um, is a, a step further into um, increasing the reach that we have across um, across the different South African fleets. I couldn't. Um, not talk about a little bit briefly about our bird scaring line uh, project, which is um, working with the communities of Ocean View um, in in this very um, interesting and long-standing project that the Albert Task Force has had, where uh, these persons with disabilities, a team of ten that produce our bird scaring lines that we then supply to industry and as you can see in the video are in use via offshore trawls and soon also via inshore trawls um, in South Africa and the contributions that they are making to to this um, these efforts in reducing seabird bycatch are enormous and we are tremendously grateful to this team for their work and, and also we are very happy to be able to help them and support them, even if in a small way, for the work that they are doing in contributing to reducing seabed bycatch in South Africa. And um, I wanted to conclude that the, we feel that the key to the success of the Arbitrary Task Force Force has been adaptability, moving and facing these challenges um, Things aren't, weren't as easy as in the beginning when we first started and we had two fleets in, uh, where we could um, reduce seabird bycatch on uh, because they had more in these plans and we were working well with government. Uh, so we have adapted and we're doing a lot of advocacy work. And we're still one of our closest um, and most successful approaches has also been to maintain these close ties with the fishermen so that we can ensure in lasting compliance and committed government involvement, which is ultimately our goal. We shouldn't be doing this in perpetuity. It's, a, it's something that the South African government um, needs to also help and, and take responsibility for to drive further. And we are working with them and they are working with us. So we are hopeful and, and that this will happen. 
Our goal is to ultimately significantly reduce seabird bycatch and sustaining these gains across all South African fisheries that in some way threaten seabirds or put them at risk uh, today in South Africa. I would like to thank some of the funders of our work. The RSVP has been a significant funder for our core work um, for many years. Uh, some of our recent project funders and also significant donors. A big thank you to all of you. It would be impossible for us to do any of our work if we, would, if we didn't get support from our donors. If you would like to donate towards the Arbitrage Task Force, we do need um, funds always, and, um, and it would be great for us to uh, have a third member in our team. We are quite stretched at the moment. There is a lot of work to do, as you could see from our initial table, and we need more capacity. However, that requires funding, and it would be great if um, we could receive some help from from you. If you like to contribute or know more about this project, please don't hesitate to contact me, Andrea Angel, and my email address is there on the screen. Thank you very much, and I look forward to taking your questions. Hi, right, Andy, thank you so much, um, not only for your excellent presentation, but also the very important work that you and Reason do through the Albatross Task Force to conserve our very precious seabirds. I think it's fair to say that the ATF has been the, the poster child of bird life South Africa for some years now in terms of our measurable successes about saving birds, in fact thousands of birds per year. Um, but your presentation has shown us exactly how much work still needs to be done across our different fisheries in South Africa and across the world. As you say, these are ocean wanderers. So lots of work still to do to protect our, our precious seabirds. And I think that the, the work that you and, and, and particularly Reason do with fishermen on the front lines really is exemplary as well. I mean, they are our frontline conservationists and without their buy-in and without their compliance, I think, you know, this, this really wouldn't go anywhere. So I know there's a few of them in the audience tonight that we're invited to watch. I've seen some familiar names in the audience like Dion. Um, so thank you to them as well for, for buying into these projects. And yeah, Andy, I just think we all um, appreciate you spending your time with us tonight, sharing the information. And I think we all wish you the best going forward. Um, if anyone would like to contribute or, or knows of companies, or organizations that might like to help out in terms of supporting the Albatross Task Force, um, please do get in touch with them. And so we'll get onto some questions now, but just before we do, let me invite you back next week. We'll hear um, Professor Doug Hairbottle tell us about Heronry Map, which is another important citizen science initiative that you can all contribute to. Um, so if you do have any questions for Andy uh, this evening, I see there are a few here that we'll deal with. Um, you can pop these in the chat, uh, sorry, in the Q&A box. Um, or if you're watching us on Facebook, you can put in the comments feed and I'll, I'll keep an, a half an eye open there. Um, okay, so Andy, we'll pick up some questions now if you're ready. Um, and we'll start, we'll start with one from Eleanor Mary, one of our um, absolute stalwarts here at Conservation Conversations, and she tends to ask at least one question an episode. And her one uh, today is, are bird scaring lines long lasting? Um, and how often do they need to be replaced? They are actually, there's, it, it varies in, in the different fleets. So we produce, we have two types. Um, there's, a, there's one type that's used in the long line fleet, which is quite a lot lighter because uh, it tends to sit higher and, and, and flatter rather than, than be like a, a physical barrier, like in the trawl vessels. And that one maybe lasts a little bit longer because it's used only at night because uh, night setting is mandatory in South Africa. So it doesn't it get exposed to, to sunlight so often and it only gets set one, once a day because long line vessels would normally set once a day uh, and at night. The trawl long line, uh, the trawl bird scaring line uh, does degrade um, more faster because it is exposed to the sunlight, uh, tall vessels fish um, during the day and at night. So, uh, but we use a thicker hose on, on the bird scaring lines and the trawl fishery. So it's about a year to two years in, in the trawl, a year and, and 
six months maybe, and maybe a year two years in, in, the, in the long line fleet that the bird scan line normally lasts. Um, but it depends. It depends. They can sometimes get entangled or they get lost or it's, uh, yeah, so it depends. Um, but that's more or less how long they last. Great, thanks. Um, there's one from Rob Simmons here. Um, Rob, is hey, suitably, Rob. <laughs> Rob is suitably impressed with the, the hook pods. Um, uh, but he says, wouldn't it be better still for the fishermen if the bait itself was protected until release happens? Uh, wouldn't that be a win-win for albatross and fishermen? <laughs> um, I think, uh, well, yes, maybe. I don't think, I don't know. I think that would be a question for a fisherman to, to see. <laughs> I, to me, uh, the fact that we are able to protect the barb with the hook pod is uh, is great. Uh, up until now, that is the, the the main threat to the seabirds is that they get hooked uh, when they go for for the bait. So if we can protect the barb, and if if fish, other fish, or other or even the birds can access the bait, well then it may be um, it's not so good for for the fishermen. But I think the less we also interfere in, in any way with how fishermen set their gear, the way they fish, um, it's really important. There is, we can't, uh, we must minimize that interaction as much as possible. And already the hook part means that something has to be set on the branch lines, which is quite significant. It could potentially impact catch, it can potentially impact the way fishermen fish and carry out their operations. And then it wouldn't be good for anyone because they wouldn't want to use it and, and it would be a loss for everyone. So I think the hook part is a pretty good compromise and it's been proven to, to work in other fleets in other countries. So we are hopeful that we hopefully can trial out here in South Africa and 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 get it working here because that would be a big win for the birds. Thanks. I see Annette um, for Slays has asked for your contact details. I'll put your email in the chat box just so if anyone does want to get in touch with Andy, um, you can use that email in the chat box now. Um, for those of you who are watching YouTube or or on Facebook, um, it's Andrea Angel at birdlife.org.za. So spelled Andrea Angel. Um, andrea.angel at birdlife.org.za um, and if you are watching on YouTube you can obviously rewind and go back to that slide in the presentation. Um, thanks for that Annette. There's a, another question here on, on hook pods so I think I'll stick with that theme. Um, Alison Lee Cox wants to know do the LED lights um, really attract fish when lines sink rather than baited hooks? So the LED, a lot of fishermen use uh, light sticks. Uh, so they, they're different practices and, and different uh, fishermen use different techniques, uh, but light sticks are often used in this, in, in this fishery. Uh, the current hook pod that we are going to, that we want into trial doesn't have an LED. It's made, uh, it's made, it's smaller, it's more compact. Uh, and the LED light has been has been removed from that. There is another one that a bigger one which does have LEDs. Uh, so it, it depends on on what fleet is using it and how they fish. Light sticks are common here in South Africa. So ideally, if the smaller one could in maybe in the future be integrated with an LED, maybe that would work. But some fishermen prefer it not not to have an LED light. So it's it's a way of making it as simple as possible with the minimum um, complications and minimum additions as possible because ev everything means that there's something that can break or something that can go wrong or something that can be faulty. And and the hook pots aren't cheap. So it's it's important that uh, they work and they work that they work effectively, hundred percent of the time, basically, or as, or as much as. So these current ones don't have LEDs, um, but yeah, and some fishermen use light sticks and others don't. Again, a question for a fisherman, yeah. I think. <laughs> Should have had a co-presenter, perhaps. Um, George Ledeck would like to know. Does the MSC certification criteria, for example, can tuna cover seabird bycatch at all? Sorry, if can you repeat that? Does the MSC certification 
does, yeah, does. So on cans of tuna and that, you sometimes see MSC certified Marine Stewardship Council. Um, yes. Does that cover seabird bycatch as part of their criteria for certification? Well, the MSC certification has three pillars, and one of them is uh, their management, one is stock, how they manage their fisheries and, and how the stock is managed, and another one is, uh, you know, protecting uh, bycatch species or threatened species in some ways. And it will depend on what, what country that, where, where, they, where that certification comes from, so where that tuna has been caught and what the risks in the country or in that fleet were identified as. So it could have been that maybe they didn't interact with seabirds or that if they did, that they've mitigated it in some way. But in theory, yes, if uh, all the threats to threatened species should have been addressed in the initial certification and there should be action plans that are addressing those threats. Uh, for them to have that certification. Certainly that's the case in South Africa. Uh, MSC certification makes, uh, gives you some um, guarantee or guarantee that we are, if, if things haven't been resolved completely in the fishery that has MSC certification, certainly there's an action plan and there are measures being taken towards that. Case in point is the inshore Hague trawl fleet where we are deploying birds carrying lines and where we are working with them actively to resolve any potential seabird bycatch that is happening in that fleet. The offshore fleet is the biggest one in South Africa and, and they have, of the entire quota, of the, the trawl quota, they have more than 90% of the quota. Um, the inshore fleet has about 10%. So it's, um, it's resolving, it's resolved that issue for the the larger portion of the fleet. And that would be the case wherever you see the embassy certification level. Thanks for that uh, insight, Andy. Um, another one from Rob Simmons here um, on a different line. He wants to, well, he says in, in Namibia, some persistent uh, foreign offenders had their boats seized. And he says this, this seems like a good, but also a very big stick to use. Um, is this at all used in South Africa? So when, when I showed the slide about the punitive measures or legislation that needed to take place in South Africa with the foreign, the joint venture foreign Japanese fleet, that did, the, the vessels weren't seized, but they had to stop fishing a couple of times over the years because they had, their bycatch of seabirds was too high. Um, and that is essentially because they were not using the bycatch mitigation measures that were in the in the permit conditions, so unfortunately, and it's that's just what it is. If you don't um, weight your lines, if you don't use a bird scaring line, and if you then don't fish at night, there are higher risks of catching seabirds. Night fishing doesn't work if it's full moon. If you're then also not using a bird scaring line, that's not going to help. And if your lines are not weighted at all, well you will catch seabirds, there's no question about it. So, so the, that punitive measures were necessary in to, were used by government. They, they did uh, stop fishing off, uh, off these vessels a couple of times in South Africa until they could resume using the mitigation measures that they needed to and reduce that bycatch. So it is a tool. Um, it's not something that we, we want uh, to do. Uh, but it's something that is needed. Otherwise, we would lose all our seabirds, basically. Okay, so we don't necessarily seize their boats, but you can sort of no. revoke their permits and cease the fishing, at least. Yes. Okay, all right. Um, all right, so I see there's another follow-up from Rob on his book pod question about protecting bait. I know you sort mm -hmm. of heard that to fishermen, but he just wants to clarify. Um, his point is that the fishermen lose less bait to birds if it's protected by the hook pods. So isn't this an advantage to them and aren't they therefore happier to use them if the hook pod's protecting the bait? Well, the hook pod, as it stands, doesn't protect the bait. It protects the hook. So it, it prevents the barb from, from showing. So the, anyone can, uh, any other predator can still take the bait. Um, and, and pull it off the hook, 
but the barb of the hook will still remain in the pod. So, um, so it doesn't prevent bait loss. It just prevents seabirds from getting hooked. Okay, I'm a bit confused because isn't the bait on the end of the barb or how, how is it configured? So the bait will still hang from, so you have the, the hook pod and the, the barb of the hook goes into the pod, but the bait is still hanging down. Okay. So you bait the hook and then put the barb in the hook pod. So only the barb okay. is sticking into the book pod as an encased by the pod, but the bait is, is still hanging from the, from the hook. Okay, so those of us who are used to sort of fishing in rivers on, with rods and that kind of thing where the bait sits right on the end of the tip of the hook, it's not necessarily... Yeah, that wouldn't be the case, no. So, so usually in these, in these fisheries, the bait is threaded right through. Right. And then the barb is then just stuck into the, into the pod. Got you. Okay, I think that might have been Rob's confusion as well. Um, okay, Chad has a question for you. And yeah, I don't have a surname here. Um, is the increased amount of nutrition available to seabirds because of offshore fishing beneficial to them in the long term? Or does it have an overall negative consequence, um, i.e. large amounts of food available to them for a reduced effort? So because fishing has been happening for centuries and there's been discards like this for a long time, birds have essentially become used to following vessels and they target fishing vessels and follow them. Particularly many of our species of albatross and some of our species of shearwaters do that. And um, what would happen if all of that stopped, if there were no discards? Um, birds would um, maybe some of them revert to hunting naturally, which they do, and look for, look for fish naturally. What has happened in, uh, in New Zealand, for instance, where that, that measure was taken, there's no more offal, is that the birds co uh, congregate when the, when the net comes up to the, to the surface in the trawl vessels and attack the net. And there are now more net entanglements than there are um, uh, collisions with, with the cables. And what they could protect with the bird scaring lines, preventing the birds from colliding with the cables, has now moved on to the nets. And they, we have no mitigation measures for the net. If birds are caught in the net or entangled in the net, there is nothing we can do. So essentially what's happened in New Zealand is that the problem has shifted to, a, to something that can't really be addressed effectively at the moment. We don't know how to address that. So why is that? Well, there is less fish in the sea. So even if birds wanted to revert back to normal hunting and how they normally fish, well, there's less fish out there and there's less food for them and resource competition and lack of resources and fishing um, and food for, for birds is what's driving a lot of other uh, issues in, in for our seabirds, for instance, for the gannets and for some of our cormorants and for the, for the penguins. So the answer is, it's providing food, and if we took that away, we might be landed up with a lot worse, uh, you know, a worse problem for the trawl fishery and for some of our fishery uh, seabirds that are used to following vessels. But ultimately, all our seabirds are suffering from an overfished ocean. Hmm. I think I think it's um, our bird of the year, the Cape Gannet, that is the subject of a study showing that gannets that were dependent on take fishery discards actually ate, you know, a fair amount of fish, but they're nutritionally less um, calorific than these other sort of high or sort of uh, demersal fish like um, anchovies and, and sardines and that, that have more fatty acids in that. So actually they might be getting fish from these boats, but it's actually not necessarily the right kind of fish for those species, which is a complication. It is a complication, but when there's no other food available, then that is an alternative that they that they go for. So mm. it's it's a yeah, it's a balancing act for them. I don't think they they yeah. prefer it. And gannets are not off, often caught in uh, as bycatch in in the fisheries, but it does happen sporadically, and a lot of that is probably driven by them looking for alternative sources of food. Mm. And then I know I'm sort of hogging the floor now for my own questions and comments, but um, you know, talking about the dependence of seabirds and uh, of, on, on fisheries and discards, but also um, 
you know, this well-developed habit now of following fishing vessels. I mm. came across a study a little while ago, you're probably aware of it. I think it was French researchers that were putting trackers on albatrosses to monitor illegal fishing and, and using these the tracks of the albatrosses and where they were clearly stopping behind a boat and, and that kind of activity that they could use, that they could get from these trackers to actually see where our boats are legally fishing. Um, I wondered if you just had any comments on on that, how strong that relationship is in that specific example. It is it is a quite a controversial thing. I remember when the study came out a few years ago, and it was highly debated about how what how wise this this was. Uh, particularly because, it's, you know, if we know that this is happening and fishermen know about this, you know, how easy is it to just take the bird out? Why would you want someone looking at you already if you're doing out in high seas? I mean, it wouldn't happen in South Africa, but in, in the high seas where there's a lot of illegal and unregulated fishing happening, having, uh, a, knowing, thinking that an albatross might be spying on you, well, it's... <laughs> let's let's get it uh, out of the sky basically so so it's not something that we would advocate for and certainly me personally i i would not want that uh, that practice to be um, instituted or to be followed up basically but it was an interesting study that did show how uh, seabirds do follow vessels and in that regard from a scientific point of view it's it's useful to know that get confirmation of that um, but not to continue using them as spies I wouldn't uh, I don't think that's very wise I think the whole point of the spy is that you're not meant to know that they're spying on you so <laughs> yes. maybe that was the fault is actually getting that research out there anyway um, there's two questions relating to hook pods and potential pollution and the one is relating to the batteries in the hook pods and whether there's any contamination and the second is if the hook pods get loose, are we concerned about plastic pollution as a result? So um, the first one, well, ba the batteries do uh, have a life, uh, as all batteries do. They, they last about, I think it's about three years. I would have to look up the actual facts, but I think it's about that. And then you exchange the batteries. So there wouldn't be any more contamination than it is from using normal household batteries. Uh, they, are, they are quite small. Uh, from a pollution point of view in terms of the hook pods getting loose. So the, the hook pods are attached to the branch lines and they are recoverable after each set. So you, you attach them to the branch line and they stay on the branch line. So they are, they are opened and they, you close them, you, you bait them, you throw them out, they open up when they're in 20 meters. And when you haul the line, you have these hook pods coming up open you then close them again, they remain on the branch line and they're ready to be deployed again. So it's a very um, practical and quite uh, easy system. It, the, the, the innovation from and the thinking around it is quite, quite amazing actually that someone comes up with these things. It takes a lot of hours of thinking about how to do this. But the good thing is that they remain on the branch lines and the, unless the branch line is cut, which does happen, you can have a shark bite or you can have some other, you know, the lines get stretched or attached in some way. And yes, you could lose them as you could lose any other fishing gear. So from the pod is, is you know, it's, it's like eight centimeters long by, by two wide. So it's not a, it's not a big thing. Uh, but yes, I mean, it, it would be, it would land up at the bottom of the ocean. Yes, it would if it gets lost and if it gets loose. And, uh, but it's not meant to. It would be incidental, it would be accidental. And I, I, some studies show, that the loss of hook pots is very, very, very low, the, the studies that have been carried out already in other countries. So it's not something that we're necessarily concerned about um, or massively concerned about, given the, the conservation uh, gain that you then have in terms of protecting seabirds and the, what you can achieve globally is, is yeah, orders of magnitude in, in terms of, you know, being better. So, sure. yeah. Okay, great. Uh, clearly, I mean, there's a lot of thought that has gone into these devices. So um, thanks for that answer. Um, yet another one from uh, Dr. Rob. And um, he says, are, are there any signs of decrease in population declines of albatross species 
as a result of this or other such programs around the globe. I guess we, we all know the stats around how many albatrosses are saved per year by mitigating bycatch, but have we seen that play out in population, the statistics? So uh, one of, uh, it's very difficult to, to get these statistics confirmed and that you can say, well, this is attributable to the work of, you know, uh, mitigation measures. But there is a study that's come out recently on the black barred albatross that is pointing towards that, that it indicates that the populations are recovering due to uh, teams of uh, albatross task force in, in, in the Southern Ocean that have been working on reducing seabird bycatch directly on the black barred albatrosses. So even though it takes a long time to, to verify this because it's dependent on, on colony work and birds coming mm -hmm. back and there's a period these pre these birds are out at sea for eight years at a time before they go back to to breed on their islands so but we are getting some indication that yes the work that we are doing is making a significant impact and populations like the black brown albatrosses are um, coming back and are increasing so it's good I think the, the the work that so many fishermen are doing in implementing these measures is amazing um, the work that we do is to promote it and try and work with them and get them uh, to take it up but ultimately it's it's the fishermen out at sea who have to use them, who have to remember to put that bird skin line out or, or set their lines at night or weight their, their branch lines. And it's their work that is reflecting and is their gain in many respects um, that we are seeing now for the black barred albatross. That's amazing that they were able to show that in the study. I saw a, a stat that came off Goth the other day. It was, it was one or other burrowing petrol, I think, um, on, on Goth after the eradication, the the breeding success had gone up from 0% in last year's breeding season to something like 80% in this year's breeding season with the removal of, of mice from, from Goth. Um, and it, it's, it's amazing that you can show that kind of result, but for, for threats at sea, where birds mm. from colonies all over the world are traveling, you know, birds from South America, the black barred albatross, for example, are traveling to South African waters, how do you tie um, work being done all over the globe back to one colony when it's very difficult or maybe impossible to know exactly which birds are coming from where, et cetera, et cetera. It's much, much harder to show that kind of result. So it's amazing it is. And, and a testament to the work that they've actually been able to do that for black browns. And that's incredible. It is, and it, it it makes you feel like we know what we are able to achieve here in South Africa, and we know what we've done, but you don't know what's happening out there in the in the in the high seas, and it's and and the work that all of the other teams are doing. Uh, recently in Namibia, they've been able to show a reduction similarly to what we we achieved here in in South Africa for the for the trawl fishery there. So it's amazing. Regionally, we are now protecting and preventing the uh, mortality of around 30,000 uh, mm. albatross uh, seabirds every year and that is uh, that is huge for two countries uh, you know in Africa mm. that that are able to do that is is quite amazing so it's good I'm, I'm very very happy with the work that we do it's I'm very proud of, of, of what we what we have been able to achieve in collaboration with industry with government with all of the fishermen everyone in the fleet has taken this on board mm. it's great I think especially you know 30,000 is, is a hell of an impressive number for one year but especially taking into account how slow albatross breed and how long lived they are that 30,000 per year could translate into 40 albatross over the lifetime of each of those albatross. So you multiply that out and it's an incredible number. Yes, yes, it is. It is. And I'm, I'm hoping in, in the next, you know, well, probably decade, we'll, we'll start seeing the effects of that because the black broad albatross effects that we're seeing now is because of work that, we, that was started by the Albatross Task Force in South Africa, in Brazil, um, primarily um, 20 years ago, you know, in 2006. Um, well, not quite 20 years ago, but not many years ago. So it's it takes time, but then we start to reap in the 
the results, which is great. Yeah, for for species with you know such they're so long lived and, and long intergenerational times, it's uh, this is work that's going to pay off you know many many decades into the future, hopefully. Um, I'm going to end on one last question from Anneli, and I know it's, it's quite an interesting one and maybe a different take to what we've discussed so far. Um, mm -hmm. She says, in terms of incentives for fishermen in the form of socioeconomic development of their families at home, are there any initiatives focusing on the communities at home and facilitating skills development or job creation, um, therefore looking at helping the whole community to be economically sustainable, um, or figuratively helping them to catch their own fish, in inverted commas, is clever wordplay, um, and not be dependent on grants. Um, do you know of any of these kinds of fishing community interventions going on? Uh, we are, we as a team, I mean, as the ATF, we are not uh, involved in any community if it's at, with working with fishermen directly at that level. Uh, we work with them uh, at sea, but not at, at that community level. Um, there are other organizations that do that, uh, that work at that level and that are making a difference. What we uh, are, the program that we have, the project that we have uh, with the bird scaring lines, manufacturing of them, some of the members of those, uh, of that community uh, are, are ex-fishermen, so they're used to fish and they come from uh, fisheries or fishing communities, one would say. Uh, so indirectly, we are through the through the Bird Scaring Line project with working with people with disabilities. It's a very focused project. We work only with that association, but they do then benefit indirectly their families that don't then have to provide for them because they they get a small remuneration from from this project. And so indirectly, we are helping um, communities that are in Ocean View that would have been involved in some way and maybe still are in, in, in some way fishing. But there are other projects that do that, uh, that work um, mostly with small scale fisheries and, and those communities in, in Claremont and Longabon and in other places. But the ATF doesn't directly work with them. And as uh, the, the Seabird team, we are not able to reach, we don't have that capacity yet to work at that level. And the terrestrial programs of bird life are more after that um so but yes it is it is something that's needed uh but there are other organizations that are working at that level wonderful well maybe andrea if um if this webinar results in a, a major funder contacting you and you get a third or a fourth staff member on the team then those could be some of the okay. the focal points but for now i think it's incredible what a two-person team between you and reason are able to accomplish um, saving literally tens of thousands of albatrosses per year already and um, expanding your work into new fisheries, new solutions, new technologies. Um, I think it's really commendable and um, we all wish you the best going forward and we, we look forward to future updates on, on positive results from all these different projects. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.